Today we have Akshaya Aradia with us. Akshaya is a senior director of engineering at GitHub, but she's also an MBA from Wharton. And she also worked at Netflix, at LiveRamp, at McKinsey and Company, Intuit. So we're talking about a smart girl here and also someone who has a lot of passions for diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. As far as I know, as I've experienced, you're someone who also speaks up quite openly as well. So we're going to be chatting a little bit about that today, and I'm really excited. And maybe we could start with, a, in a few words, how would you describe your professional self? Yeah, thanks, Ivna. I actually spent quite a lot of time building financial services and uh, building another solutions. I started my career as a front-end engineer, and I quickly realized that I, my passion lied towards back-end. And from there, I got into developing platform infrastructure services for uh, all the companies that you listed. And later on, I did my master's in data mining and machine learning. And that's one of the subjects that I really loved, big data. So I, I got deeper into that and explored more of APIs and other areas within LiveRamp, Intuit. I managed machine learning infrastructure, Netflix, along with the data platform edge organization. And now more recently, I work at GitHub. We support our platform services, the whole database infrastructure that supports all of GitHub everywhere and infrastructure in general, storage and we support Copilot, which is getting extremely popular these days. So yeah, that's our venture into the Gen AI that actually captured a lot of interest from millions of users worldwide. Lovely. Really great work that you're doing and not, not, not a lot of women in those areas. And how would you say in terms of your communication personality or your interpersonal kind of personality, how would you describe that? I believe in leading by example and what I try to embody every day is the transparency and openness people should ideally feel extremely comfortable with somebody who's talking to them. So I try to be as open and inclusive. You know me, the first time we spoke, ideally, it's just best to be who you are. It is. It is. It's a hard lesson for some, but it's so simple, right? <laughs> At the yes. end of the day. It's so simple. Like my son says, mommy, are you happy? Oh. Did you do well today? Yeah, so I, I just learned from him and I just ask people what makes them happy every day and what how they could bring their best selves to work and have a very productive conversation starting from there. Yeah, sometimes kids just simplify things, make it easy for us to remove the complexity. I know a friend who was always doing things and making choices in a certain way, but not what she wanted and what she liked until her child her 10-year-old challenged her yes. around, why are you doing this? You look so miserable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do what you love. That's what the <laughs> model should be. Yes. Yeah. And in a way, that's also part of authenticity, the way we communicate the choices that we make, but also work-life balance. And that's a topic yes. that I think we all have to deal with at some point. We have to advocate for our own work-life balance. Is that something that that you had to do at some point in your career? Most definitely. I believe it was, I think after a couple of years at uh, Accenture. In, yeah, I was working as an individual contributor at that time and I could easily put in work however many hours I wanted to in a day. And then I was, my husband and I were both workaholics. We both had the goals and everything set up and Days were shorter even then, but yeah, after some time, it just led to burnout and I never experienced what burnout was until that time. And you don't need to have family or kids to experience burnout. It just happens when you don't practice self-care. So at the time I was trying to time box or divide the time. If I work eight hours or 10 hours a day on this one, I should probably spend two hours exercising or like all the formulas but life doesn't work that way life is not mathematical so that was the first time I learned to advocate for myself I just worked out a schedule with my co-workers and managers again being very humble and authentic and transparent helps right so we set a schedule that worked for us and at that time I thought okay this problem is yeah I take 
breaks every four hours or two hours. I, I get brain breaks and then do the best work you can, go home and all that. But the second opportunity came when I actually returned to work after my maternity leave. And then I was physically and mentally exhausted. <laughs> it was really hard to just get back into the rhythm. And that's harder when you're actually managing a couple of people. It just worked out that way. I went ahead and just set up some expectations with all the people who were working with me again and customers, stakeholders, PMs, imagine whoever works with you in the workplace. And I just laid out my rules. Like these are the times when I will be available at work. These are the flexible work options that the company may be offering. And this is the accommodation that I need. So the word accommodation is more frequently used in other contexts or, or Perhaps somebody has a disability, perhaps somebody has some other challenges, but you don't, if you need accommodations, you don't need to wait for something to happen. You, you just realize that's what your body needs and that's what your mind needs. And you take that time to be the best cell or to bring the best self to, uh, back, to, back home to your families. Yeah, for the most part, it was a little bumpy when I got back, but I've, uh, Learn to take vacations that are very crucial towards recharging yourself. Practice mindfulness, yoga, meditation, and things like that that help you just make better decisions, I, I would say. So yeah, work-life balance means many things. I also did my MBA. So while after I had a baby, work-life balance meant that I would probably be working on East Coast hours during certain times of the day to balance my schedule at Warden. Or I would probably take off on a Friday and work on Saturday because it was still a smaller company and we needed to work within tight schedules. So yeah, I, I've had in, uh, pleasure working with some incredible people and I'm very grateful for all the opportunities I've had. But this conversation is never too simple. So I'm uh, happy to provide more guidance or mentorship if somebody likes to chat with me more. Yeah, yeah. Those are difficult situations. Like you said, you were mentally and physically exhausted. And then the MBA itself is a full-time job, even if you have no kids or husband. Yes. I don't know how you did that, but yes. you did apparently. It's magic. And then yeah. I will tell you a crazy story. I trained my body to stay awake between 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. Uh, for almost two years so that I get that time block of time to actually study and keep up uh, with my Wharton cohort, like uh, board train rides to San Francisco at that time and uh, studying on the train. So it's not as a woman or a female leader in tech uh, or otherwise any other place, you're expected to do better. You're expected to be your best self, right? And you have to be the best mom. You have to be the best wife. You have to be the best leader there is. So without compromising anything within this 24 hours the, that's there on earth, it, it's just hard uh, to be the best for two years if you don't set up the right expectations and accommodations anywhere. Yeah, that's why I loved when you said, I set expectations with everyone around me Yes, around what you needed essentially and how you wanted people to work with you to make yes. it work for the accommodation that you were talking about. So otherwise you knew that you would burn out and then you wouldn't be helpful to anyone. Yes. So you, you needed to set those guiding rules for everyone. Was it easy for you? Because often there's this fear that, oh my gosh, what are they going to think of me? That I'm not committed to my leadership role, that I'm a mom now. And that means... I'm not prioritizing work. I, there's all these weird things that people think, right? I don't know how you dealt with that because it's it's really hard to share those things with people. Yes, especially in platform and infrastructure world, there are not many women in general, right? It's across the board. And then when you are, you have to lead by example. You have to showcase what you can bring to the table because people make up their mind based on how you are, right? I wanted to be that person who showcased what it would take, the commitment, the discipline, integrity to achieve the goals that you set for yourself and the hard work it takes. But this conversation is never easy. 
you got to be able to work with people who believe in you, who who could be your sponsors, who could be your mentors at the workplace, who advocate for you. So I was fortunate to build a very good rapport with the customers, the people that I worked with at that time. And it was hard work, especially at, at a company of that size, right? But And we were growing so fast across many different countries and you have to learn how to do multinational management. So the value proposition that I actually presented my manager with was, I'm going to bring the skills that I learned at Wharton back to my workplace and I'm going to train or level up other leaders, right? Or at least start implementing whatever I learned at my work from day one. Even after I graduated from Wharton, I did the same at Netflix. If you could help the company grow, if you could help the people who you work with, that's a huge success story, right? So that's what I remind people is you're here to do the best work you can, to be the best among all of your competitors. And you can't do that if you're burnt out. You can't do that if you're not physically and mentally fit. People take mental health for granted. I want people to take a good care of their brain as well. Like the airline says, put the oxygen mask on yourself first <laughs> before helping others. So yeah, it's it, it was challenging. I did walk amongst people who did change this game a little bit by bringing their own agendas or, hey, this is what success looks like. I really, I came across this person who was, who had this ideal notion of a leader. And then I was uh, trying to address something at a panel discussion and he expected somebody else to show up, but I walked in through the door, a woman, person of color, not very intimidating personality-wise or height-wise, right? Oh, oh, you're the person who's talking at the AI conference. Oh, you're the person. And I was like, who are you expecting? So yeah, establishing trust with those people, combating bias, all of that needs to happen, irrespective of where you are in your career journey and that has to happen ideally before you ask for accommodations most likely or that's what I thought but industry has changed a lot I've seen people advocating for themselves from day one whether they're an intern or an exec the world has changed a lot in the last decade yeah and that's wonderful to see uh, those changes and it seems like you really focused on okay, in order to be my best self and deliver the most and, and and do the best here, I actually have to take care of myself first. And because you were so focused on that, and then one of your personality traits is transparency. And then you're also looking into ways to add value, but in a way that was reasonable to you and in, in what you needed, your body needed, your mind needed. Yes, without compromising the outcome, without compromising uh, the expectations of the job. It's a zero-sum game uh, <laughs> sometimes. you got to give and take. And yeah, especially when you're dealing with back-end code, sometimes you're not, you may be in roles where you're completely isolated from customers, especially if you're an individual contributor and you got to motivate yourself and be abreast with any kind of technology like Gen AI just took off over the last couple of months or the year plus but before that was big data before that was something so you got to spend time learning new tech you got to spend time mastering that along the journey you got to spend time building trust with your coworkers, if mentoring people leveling people up and then when you're a manager you're you got to spend time lending your ear work on your listening skills spend time <laughs> with your team and developing a strategy, vision, helping the company. So time is one of the most valuable assets somebody could give to their family or their community or themselves. The higher you go up the ladder, you start realizing that more. That's what I meant by advocate for yourself. You need to know where to spend the best hours of your life. That's true. Time is such a valuable asset. When we... Don't use it the way we want to use it. It just escapes. It disappears. It dissipates in thin air and it's gone and it'll never come back. Yes. So it's very, <laughs> it's, it's very relevant and for sure. You were talking a little bit about the whole bias thing, like the guy who came and expected someone else. Yeah. <laughs> so when have you spoken up 
to point out against bias, bias against yourself or maybe even other people? Yes, I would say there have been a couple of instances. Like, for example, early on in my career, I had this manager who at first I thought maybe they didn't notice when I spoke. So I spoke up and they would just not even acknowledge. But when a male coworker in the same meeting room said the exact same thing, literally a couple of seconds later, he just applauded and like he he encouraged that person and it happened a couple more times. And that's when I started to realize that if I don't speak up, I would never make that other person understand the impact or the signals that they're giving out to the rest of the team. So if I face the bias now, considering that person has been a manager for a very long time, other people may have experienced it too. So you got to learn how to be brave, especially when it doesn't matter if you're an expert in that field or if you're an intern, you just have to speak your mind and I just pointed out the unconscious bias that person had at that time. And they immediately tried to, oh, I did not know I did that. Oh, I didn't pay attention. Oh, this, that. Hopefully it gets resolved easily. Sometimes it has to go all the way to the HR. But fortunately with this manager, it didn't. The other time was when, I will not name the company because the company is great. Just, I think the company is made of people. We were... I'm all for equal access or equal opportunities for all. And I'm the first female engineer for on both sides of my family, actually. I take pride in that. And I want to be careful not to show my bias towards just picking the candidate who are just like me, right? So I check myself at the door every time. But this company just didn't notice a pattern with a person, right? This one person had a very weird way of writing their scorecards after an interview and wouldn't in the last one and a half years before before I saw the pattern I'm a data person I look at categories patterns analyze things right so I went back and the very first scorecard and he was my peer so not my not the person who reports to me so think about the dynamics right he wrote something like oh team building is an essential part of the job and this person wants to leave at four o'clock every day. Although we are flexible and we do allow people to work late at night, I think I don't think they will establish the same wrap with the team members. And all in all, it's a lot of words to just say that the woman who interviewed for the role had to pick up her children by 5 p.m. So she asked to leave the office at four to leave the city which gets super crowded at that time right and I was like the name and the scorecard kind of like everybody else said she's still up for the job so what gives right and it's the same thing I look back and comment about how unprofessional person showed up during the interview and they were not taking it seriously something like that three months before that they were like I looked up that person person's profile last around and that's their ethnic hairdo. That's how they are. Like they bought themselves to work, right? Just because it's different for you doesn't mean it's not appropriate, right? So things like these went on for one and a half years and there was, there were no female engineers on that person's team for quite a while, right? Or they transferred out or something like that and nobody would speak up. So this is where you got to have that hard conversation to make people understand if they're doing deliberately or all of, doing all of this deliberately or was it a one-off issue? And if it's a pattern, how do you address that? How do you educate that? And you got to work with people, leaders, HR. you got to do the right thing so that the company, this one person doesn't embody the whole company, the company that we all love to work. So I'll just stop it at that for now. Wow. Those things still happen and they probably happen more than we even notice in pointing out, like you said, we need to learn how to be more brave and and bring those things up because sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not intentional. Your manager, you brought it up and he didn't even realize that he was doing that. And like you said, it's affecting other people as well. Where do you find your brave? I grew up with 
uh, a brother and <laughs> he was the bravest person i knew next to my grandmother and as a child i was trained to just speak be as brave as a person could be but you got to encourage yourself you got to be your own champion because tech industry is a different ball game it is a place where it's especially silicon valley is a small world it's a place where you're a second or third degree connection to somebody who knows somebody right so it's just if you think about all of that and if you keep what you have to say within your own heart it just breaks you after some time so you got to be your own champion you got to understand that you're serving the bigger purpose and as a manager think about you're a multiplier think about how you can influence the community think about the workplace that you're creating especially if i'm one of those people who wants to break the norms in tech for example like for many of my roles i don't even keep college education as a criteria anymore cuz i give everybody equal opportunity and i work with many neurodiverse people in tech who may not even have a traditional degree for many different reasons but they're still at their jobs so i want to keep an opportunity open for that i support lgbtq people at workplace like i support women in tech underrepresented minorities so people who can bring themselves to work people who can make the whole workplace authentic right those are the people i i want to encourage more because not all roads are paved equally for everybody and if you don't speak up your mind or if you cannot be brave how are what kind of leader do you want them to be in the future they will think twice after looking at you oh, should i have done that or should i have spoken up my mind and advocated for myself like xyz should i have lifted other people up in their career should i have created paths for different people like this leader who i admire so that's where the bravery comes from i love that and it's interesting you talk about being open not only trying to help out underrepresented and all that but the fact that you are creating equal opportunities for people without degrees and usually they're not considered i haven't heard anybody talk about that and it's interesting because i did my mba at insead there was one person in the entire class that did not have a degree. Very smart dude. He's doing so good right now. Like he is very senior at yep. Amazon. And a lot of people frowned upon it, but the school selected him even though he had no degree. Yes. And so I find it great that you talk about that because there's huge potential there as well. Some people just didn't have the opportunity. Yes, that's why I said not all roads are paved uh, the same way or equally because there's equality and then there's equity and there are different ways of looking at the world and I've come across people who came from different socioeconomic backgrounds who couldn't go to Ivy League, right? I'm I noticed uh, on one of my teams at a certain company they were only grads from UC Berkeley. Why? right it's just it just shows up like people want to select or there's a culture fit access, uh, aspect towards work or uh, recruitment and you just realize that just bars people from even entering or breaking the barrier so then i came across many neurodiverse people in tech and the public school system here in the us looks for certain signals and they may not have excelled in public schools they may prefer to study a certain way or we, even without a degree the coding may be their special interest and they would want to excel in that and they train themselves so why not give them an opportunity like why stop them from applying if they could be better or equal or better than anybody who came through that door why not give them a chance right so create that inclusive and accessible workplace so that people can actually come in without having to worry about impressing others for the wrong things. So, it seems like your brave, your bravery to speak up comes from a principled approach. I was like principled negotiation. I would say you have a principled approach to it because you have these principles around what you want to do, what you believe in, and you're speaking up on behalf of that, but also champion yourself as part of that. 
yes, we work really hard. People are like, oh, but you got an MBA from an Ivy League. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just something, this realization came after that. I was like, why didn't I think about this? The world is so different. And then you got to meet so many people as a part of the journey. And you just need to look back and think about what makes Silicon Valley so great. What? Who are the people who built some of these successful companies? Did they have the all of these cookie cutter degrees? <laughs> if somebody judged these people the way or Mark Zuckerberg or anybody, right, for that matter, Bill Gates, the same way, oh, if you need an undergraduate degree, like, where would they be? <laughs> they lead billion dollar company, they're extremely successful. So that that's what got me thinking. I believe Elon Musk also has a podcast where he's talking about whether education is necessary, or what are the signals that make somebody successful. And I was like, yes, see, it. it's not just me, other people evaluated the workplace and they know what what they need you need motivated people who are passionate towards solving the problem who believe in the vision or the cause or why that's a company was set up what are they trying to achieve you need people who other people would like to work with or people who move the needle in a certain direction people who generally want to do the right thing without compromising any of their personal values right so you also need people who are willing to speak their minds unapologetically about what they believe in that Absolutely. vision. Absolutely. Speak <laughs> logically because life is short, right? People will remember you by the contributions you made to the society, how you helped them, how you made them feel. Not because, oh, this person got four dot oh and they were a Palma scholar. Nobody cares after some time. <laughs> it's just the way how the world works. <laughs> So you have all these beliefs and you speak up about them. How have you been able to, beyond yourself, encourage other leaders around you to also consider diversity and equity in their workings and their selections and their interviews and their conversations and their teams? That's an excellent question. And as I mentioned before, accessibility and equal opportunity drives me Every day. As a leader, I'm very motivated to create positive changes in the workplace, educate people about how other people bring themselves to work, what make what helps them. Somebody may be autistic or may have ADHD or they may have some other condition. They view the world differently than you, right? Somebody may have a physical disability. This is where accessibility comes into the picture. How do you enable people to code even with their voice commands, even if they cannot type, right? How do you create tech that helps people be more productive? Can you use machine learning or AI to do that? Can you build other tools or create other avenues where people could benefit from learning about each other, right? I post certain tips on certain channels. In my spare time, I am also a part of Palo Alto Community Advisory Committee, which works with special needs children across Palo Alto. So I want these the society to be ready for these children when they grow up, by the time they grow up, right? So that is my motivator. So when I come back to work as a tech leader or an exec, I just train all the people who I work with, with inclusive or accessible features that we should have in this product or how do you make workplace more inclusive? How do you make people thrive? For example, recorded demos. If somebody, you don't put somebody on the spot if they have social anxiety or they they have some other condition going on, right? You don't ask people, hey, self-identify yourself, what's your disability? You don't do that. <laughs> without calling people out, without making them feel other. If you level the playing field, what works for, what's an accommodation for one, maybe an, a perk or a something that benefits everybody. Recorded demos became popular across different teams. That was just a small thing, but it goes a long way. How do you judge people for promotions? Oh, somebody will, they should at least give XYZ talk at this conference or write 100 blogs. And I was like, really, that's great. But these are also the other ways where you could actually judge them. How many people did they level up? How many repos have they built over time that benefited the open source community? There are different indicators. For You don't need to be 
you don't need to look like a certain somebody you don't need to behave like a certain somebody not everybody can be an extrovert not everybody can stand in front of 500 people and present if you can be all of this it's great you're a rock star but you should pave the way for other people who may not have all checked all the boxes that you may have searched for right so I train the managers that way. I work with people to listen what could benefit the workplace. I cre- I believe in creating psychologically safe environments. So if anybody wants to reach out, they could do so one-on-one or I could bring in people uh, from outside of the workplace to talk to them, to mentor them, cross-company collaboration. So yeah, th- there are many different things. I do this at, with early childhood education too, outside of work. That's one of my passions. But hopefully in a decade, people would learn to accept everybody the way they are. That would be a success story. Yeah, it would, because feeling judged is never fun. Yes. Feeling excluded because of who you are is never fun yes. because yes. you're not in a certain way. I've seen that you've been on boards of of schools and colleges and all sorts of things. So you're very active. Yeah. The big data program at SFSU, that was different. And I would like to call out though, San Francisco is one of the most liberal, most progressive places I've ever worked at. So that's where I learned that using the right gender pronouns, they're very important. So being inclusive starts from simple things, recognizing people for what they are and who they are, what they consider themselves to be, being open. This is where when you work at places which are like very diverse, you tend to understand what makes people happy. Going back to what my son said, how are you happy today? (laughs) It all comes back to, are you happy? Are you making people around you happy, supporting and broadcasting happiness? (laughs) <laughs> at work. I love it. Children teach you some of the greatest lessons in, in life. They do. They certainly do. And it's nice that we started with your son's statement and we ended with your son's statement. <laughs> I don't know if it was planned, but I no. love it. It works out very well. <laughs> yes. It's be yourself. I guess I'm my son's mom first and everything else is next. And everything else is next. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. This was lovely and an inspiration for our listeners to know how to advocate for themselves, find their brave, be happy, advocate for their own uh, inclusion and opportunities and advocate for other people's opportunities and inclusion and diversity as well. Not only gender, but also you shared so many different options like neurodiversity, the degrees, really looking at it from Uh, economic diversity being open and seeking happiness seeking happiness you work towards that that should be your life school (laughs) kpi how happy are you today (laughs) kpi yes happiness of yourself and the team and the family absolutely (laughs) thank you so much akshaya thank you so much thanks for introducing me to this podcast series with some of the great speakers in the past i enjoyed listening to them and i appreciate the value that you're bringing to to the community while building a network of people or influencers in this area thank you wonderful thank you thank you i appreciate that thank you have fun have fun (laughs) have fun and be happy yes